In this video, we will talk about what it means to evaluate art. So here I have written that your personal response is completely valid. Disliking every single work of art in this class is valid, though it would be kind of weird. It's important to be able to write about why certain works of art are historically and culturally important. Even if you don't like what's being depicted or how it's being depicted, it is important that you're able to talk about why it mattered. And you can talk about why you don't like it. But in order to do all of those things, you need to know how to write about art. So when you're writing about a work of art, you need to introduce it. Introduce the facts. Who made it? When? Where? During what movement? How big it was? What medium? What subject? You need to orient your reader so they know what you're talking about. Then analyze it. How do the facts interact with the overall message the piece is going for? Is there a particular significance to the medium size subject? Everything we just listed. And then you use that analysis to evaluate why the art is important. What kind of impact does it have on the meaning overall? Does it create a new genre of art, a new technique, a new style? Or is there some sort of cultural or historical significance to the work? And does it change with the passage of time? Or is the artist just expressing something that's important to them and or other people? So who decides what art is good? I don't think there's necessarily a singular answer, more so a bunch of factors that just came together and created the art world. So some people think beauty's in the eye of the beholder, such that good art is really immeasurable because it's totally personal and subjective. Now other people think that what is the most technically impressive is the quote, best art. So it looks the most naturalistic or realistic or has the best technique in it. However, this disregards much of art history, especially after photography was invented. Once photography was able to capture a scene pretty much exactly as it looked, art didn't need to do that anymore. So then you had people like the Impressionists who were maybe not, quote, technically sound in rendering something exactly realistic, but they made something that was beautiful and captured something that photography couldn't at the time. And as with most things, people who invent something become famous. So, like I just used the Impressionists as an example, they're famous because they innovated. They created something that hadn't been done before. And what other people think, and is probably the most true, is that cultural experts, which in this case would be museums, museum directors, art critics, art historians, other artists, they all decide what's good or not based on their education. And a lot of people just take that for what it is because they do have an education in the art world. But that tends to become elitist and exclusive and full of unconscious bias fueled by Western-centric art education. All of these factors could and are true, but not one of them totally takes the cake. Because there are plenty of people who are creating great art who aren't recognized by cultural experts. There are people who are creating new things that don't get recognition. There are people that make great art that didn't invent anything new. There are people that make beautiful art that's not technically impressive. And yeah, art's always subjective, so that kind of is a catch-all for nothing and everything is art. But when it comes down to history and who actually gets recognized and who gets the fame and whose art sells for millions, usually the cultural experts, and again, this would be museums, art critics, art theorists, art historians, they're probably going to decide because they create the shows, they fill the shows, and that's who gets the publicity. And publicity is basically what writes the story. So when you have a bunch of shows, you're the one that goes down in history. So... Whoever the system favors is pretty much who's going to be decided as having, quote, good art. There were plenty of women and people of color and people of low socioeconomic status and other oppressed identities who were making art during periods who are just now being found out because they weren't recognized by the institution because they were seen as less than. So it changed the entire narrative of what was good art at the time because they just were excluded. Which brings us to censorship, which is basically just institutional exclusion. Whether they're censoring certain types of artists, a specific artist, or some piece of an artwork, they're excluding it from view from the public. So the Academy was what decided for a long time what was and was not good art and what could be presented. And throughout art history, women were painted nude because they were symbolizing some kind of idea or maybe a mythological character like Venus is depicted quite a lot. Because they weren't considered real women, they were ideas or concepts. It wasn't really seen as painting a nude woman, even though they definitely were. 
So Manet challenged this by this painting, The Luncheon on the Grass, and his painting Olympia, which we'll learn about later, because he was depicting real women that existed in real time with all of the people consuming the art. So this painting was actually banned when Manet tried to first exhibit it. And if we're following the censorship of women in art, pop art depicted a lot of naked women or just sexualized women. Under the guise that it was a critique of the media that was actually sexualizing women. However, you can't participate in a problem and claim that you're calling out the problem. And ironically, when a woman, Evelyn Axel, made a piece that was doing the same thing, but she was actually criticizing those other pop artists, it was banned on Facebook. But the Philadelphia Museum of Art challenged this, and now Facebook has allowed the image to be posted again. And on the note of pop art, this is another example. All the time we hear about male pop artists, and this was a woman who was doing the same thing. She was making work just as valid, but she wasn't accepted by the institutions because she was a woman. And now we see her work and we wonder what other women were also making the same kind of art. To get a bit more contemporary, we have some censorship of Judy Chicago's The Dinner Party. The Dinner Party consists of 39 elaborate place settings representing historical and mythological women, literally giving them a seat at the table and defying the notion that their body is obscene, invalid, or shameful. And she does this by making vagina place settings. And it was not well received initially, even by the art world. But now you can actually see it in the Brooklyn Museum of Art even today. And an even more contemporary and recent example is hashtag free the nipple, which we've seen on social media, challenging the censorship of women's bodies when men don't receive the same censorship. So censorship is just a faction of evaluating art. It's more of an institutional level. A critique is a much smaller scale. For art students, this is a way that their work is evaluated and it's equivalent to an exam. During an art student's critique, each student will pin their work up on the wall and they will all take turns responding to the work. For artists who aren't in school, a critique is just a way to get feedback from other people. And during a critique, you basically just get feedback about your work. A helpful critique tells you what is and is not working. This is not to say someone's going to tell you this is why your art is bad. Instead, it's a way for you to look at moving forward with your work whether that be if you're going to create a series or if you're just going to keep working on the piece being critiqued. Or maybe they're going to tell you about other artists who are doing similar things or talking about similar topics so that your work becomes more contextualized within the art world. So during some critiques, the artist has a chance to talk about their work and what they want everyone to know going into looking at it. During a cold read, the audience just looks at the work and gives it a cold read. You're, you're giving them your initial reaction without knowing any information outside of the artwork in front of you. And this is really helpful to artists because while most of the time their artwork is accompanied by a statement, whether they're applying to a show, they're in a show, or whatever, they usually have an artist statement. But a cold read will help them know whether their artwork is communicating what they want it to without having that statement along with it. I can't speak for critiques outside of academia or, you know, people being rude out in the world, but in general, critique is supposed to be a safe space. It's a safe space to hear criticism, to ask questions, and to share. A lot of art deals with heavy topics, so it is absolutely imperative that a level of respect and maturity is maintained during a critique, whether you be the person giving a criticism or the person receiving feedback. Everyone is welcome to make art, everyone is welcome to express themselves, and we want to be able to grow together in a communal safe space. This is an example of what it would look like during a critique. You see a bunch of different artwork all pinned up on the board, and students will take turns looking at each piece, moving left to right, right to left, talking about what each work is doing and how. I will reiterate that the push pins are around the artwork, not through the artwork, or it's being held by clips and then that's pinned up. You never want to put a push pin in your artwork, unless it's conceptually relevant, but for critique we're assuming it's not. Giving strong feedback is more than just saying, I do or do not like something. You need to tell them what is and is not working and why. So while saying, you did a good job, or I like it, is really nice and it could be very true, it's not really helpful at all. In a critique setting, it would be more productive to say something like, I really like how you cropped in on the still life. It creates a strong composition that feels very balanced. So in this example, it's not that the first comment wasn't nice, but they're learning something from this one. You're telling them what is working so that they can pursue it again in the future. Now, while those examples were positive criticism, that is definitely not to say that we're not going to tell people where they have room to grow. Critique is not always positive. 
So a poor example of constructive criticism would be, I would not have drawn those lines so thick. It looks wrong. So this is just kind of criticizing someone without giving them any substance and helping them at all. So instead, you could say something that's more constructive while addressing the exact same concerns while giving them a possible solution to pursue in the future. You could do this by saying, if you had used thinner lines in the background and thicker lines in the foreground, the drawing would make more sense spatially. I would play with your line weight more the next time to achieve a stronger depth. So you're basically still telling them what you think is a shortcoming, but you're also telling them how they can improve it. So you're helping them learn by sharing some knowledge that you've also learned. Long story short, just be constructive with your criticism and make sure you guys are really trying to help each other get better. No one needs to be told that their work is perfect all the time. That doesn't help anyone, but just be kind. So for the following image, you could say something like, I would pay more attention to the details in the form because the fingers and nails on the left hand do not seem as accurate as those on the right. I often measure with my pencil to help me find the correct angles. In saying this, I've pointed out something I think is a shortcoming, but I've also given them something to think about that I use to correct the same problem. Another example would be, I think the use of color is successful in this piece because it gives the hands a sense of dimensionality. However, I think that I would have added more highlights because the left hand seems a bit flat. I recognize something that is working and something that is not working, telling them why. Another example, your use of line work is interesting. I like the tension between the uniform lines in the back and the chaotic catches in the hands. Is there a conceptual reason behind this contrast? So in this one, I've noted some formal aspects of the drawing, but I'm asking a question because I want to understand. I'm giving a conceptual critique because I want to know is there a conceptual reason or is this just an aesthetic choice? Asking a question is a valid form of feedback. It's not necessarily a criticism, but it's definitely valid in critique because it gives the artist something else to think about that they may not have noticed before. So there are basically infinite responses that you could articulate in a critique, but these are just some really good jumping off points if you're new to conceptual criticism. So first, you could analyze the formal aspects of the techniques and how they relate to the concept. So this could be like how the size or the medium or the color affect the communication of the concept. You could also look at the way the piece is working with a current issue or a theory that you've studied. You could look at the same piece through different theoretical lenses. For example, eco-theory, critical race theory, feminist, queer, Marxist, post-colonial, anti-ableism, visual rhetoric. You could read a work of art through any of those, a combination of those, and any theory I didn't mention. So for the third example, you could look at how the piece interacts with art history and with other contemporary artists. So in Axel's ice cream example earlier, she was communicating with art history and contemporary artists around her using that same style in order to criticize the subject matter that they were using as men. And the last one is any visceral reaction that you have to a piece, whether that's in your gut or something that you feel emotionally. Maybe you look at something and it's just a really big painting and you feel kind of overwhelmed by the size of the painting. Or maybe the artist was playing with color theory and they're giving you a headache with the color choices that they used. That's a visceral response. In order to put these different approaches in action, we're going to analyze a work by Kara Walker titled A Subtlety. For context, this was created in 2014 using Domino's Sugar and a Domino's Sugar refining plant in order to look at the exploitation of labor, particularly referencing slavery in America. The first approach we're going to take is the formal and technical aspects. When we do this, we want to ask, do the technical aspects like size, material, style, composition, lighting, contrast, rhythm, balance, do any of those relate to the concept being communicated and how? She installed her work in the actual sugar factory and she used the medium of sugar to create the piece. So she's actually connecting it even more to the actual labor of producing the material because people had to produce the sugar. The size of the piece references a monument dwarfing the viewer and serving as a literal metaphor for the prevalence of the subjugation and sexualization of black women. The style of the artwork references the racist caricatures of black slaves with exaggerated facial and bodily features. Using a white medium relates the piece to ancient marble sculptures while also addressing the racial nature of the concept. By making the piece out of sugar, something that we consume daily, it also reflects on the prevalence of consumption of exploited labor within capitalism. Next, we're going to look at a theoretical approach. We're going to ask what theories, art-related or not, are being used here. Are any of them applicable to the artwork that the artist may not have intended? Why? How? Think about who and what is being depicted and how. Looking at the history of labor represented in the setting and echoed in the production of the final sculpture, we could take a Marxist approach, analyzing the relationships between social class and labor. 
Using critical race theory, we could examine the depiction of this subject as a black person and what that specifically means within history as well as in contemporary culture. Using a feminist theoretical lens, we can look at the objectification and sexualization of women via the exaggerated breast size and shape. All three of these theories could analyze the fact that the woman is a sphinx in different ways as well. A Marxist may say that it looks at capitalism's exploitative abuse of workers. A critical race theorist would look at this as the dehumanizing of black people in media. And a feminist would look at the same animal depiction as a metaphor of submission. Now we're going to take a contextual approach, looking at references to culture and art history. For this one, we're going to ask, what does the artwork reference? How? What does this similar imagery mean? How are they connected? How is the artist using it? Is the artist criticizing this reference or using it as a symbol for the same idea? The most obvious references here are the American Mammy figure and the Egyptian Sphinx. Using the Mammy archetype connects the sugar factory to its origins in slavery, while simultaneously looking at the present-day use of characters like Uncle Ben and Aunt Jemima, reflecting the imagery and attitudes still alive today, as well as the manipulation of the poor. The Sphinx is the epitome of a product produced by slavery. In wedding these two images together, Walker looks at the timeless subjugation, abuse, and exploitation of those not in power. The last approach we're going to take is expressive, or having a visceral response. This is where you ask yourself, what is your physical reaction? What do you feel in your gut? Can you explain why? Is something off about it? Are you offended? How do you interact with the piece spatially? So this work of art will resonate with different people differently based on their experiences and their identity within those experiences. This sculpture looms over the viewer, which itself can give a visceral response of wonder or of intimidation. Thinking about the individual grains of sugar becomes impactful because of their sheer amount, especially if the grains become a metaphor for individual lives used to create the sugar as a product to be consumed. The work becomes emotionally overwhelming. The viewer could think about the act of farming, refining, and packaging, all before being reconstructed into this monument, which itself is gut-wrenching for those it represents, as it is both racist and sexist. The sculpture is also transient or temporary. It'll get washed away, responding to the disposability of those victimized by capitalism. So again, we're going to conclude by thinking, so what? Why does this matter? Why do we care? Well, for one, we discussed that the institutions decide who is and is not remembered, who gets the most money, and who gets exhibition. Another thing to think about is that art is conceptual. It's not about just looking pretty. Hopefully examining these different approaches to conceptual art will open your mind to looking at the weird stuff that is contemporary art in a new way. Basically, just question everything about the work, and you'll probably come up with some kind of meaning. And remember, it's totally valid not to like a work of art but you should try and understand what it's saying. So we're gonna end on this piece that was created by Kehinde Wiley. Using what you learned about evaluating art and giving a conceptual critique, respond to this work of art. What are the historical references? Why do they matter? What does it make you feel? Are there any theories at play? What are the formal elements and how are they working? Make sure you get some sleep, stay safe, and we will discuss your thoughts next class.